Hi, everyone. Welcome to the Timing Research Show for September 8th, 2015. My name is David Cosmeter. I'm the creator of Timing Research. And today we will be talking about the 102nd weekly report uh, from Timing Research. If you haven't had a chance to take a look at this yet, just go to timingresearch.com slash reports, and you can download that or any past report there. Uh, I have Dave Landry of DaveLandry.com hosting for me again today, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to him. Thank you, David Cosmeter. Thank you to TimingResearch.com for having me back once again. We've got a good lineup today. Everybody's a veteran on the show, so I'm glad to see you, um, all three of you guys back again today. Uh, let's uh, start with you, Jason. Tell us a little bit about yourself, a little bit about your trading, and a little bit about, uh, which I think is a cool website name, theliononline.net. <laughs> go ahead. Sure. Uh, well, for those of you that are brand new, uh, thanks for coming, and my pleasure to work with you guys today, as always. Um, I work as an independent uh, uh, trading coach, mentor, and independent trader. I trade uh, only my own accounts, and I educate and inform people how to get better position in the market, focusing on psychology mostly. And uh, there's some details of what I do on my website, thelineonline.net, or .com, either one will take you to the same page. And uh, I'm actually uh, in the process of working with someone to help create a new online presence, which will allow a little bit easier and more affordable access to what I do. So I'll keep you all posted. So if you're interested in learning more about what I do and, and you like what you hear kind of resonates with you during the broadcast today, you're welcome to sign up for my email database. That's my first point of entry. And then I'll make sure and keep you in the loop. So uh, thanks for having me. Cool. Glad to be here. Glad, glad that you're here. I'm sorry. Um, all right, Thomas, let's go to you next. Thomas Alelo of orderflowedge.com. Tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your trading and, of course, orderflowedge.com. Sure, good stuff. Glad to be here again, Dave. Thanks for having me. Glad to have you. Great company I'm in here today. Um, you know, the way that we trade basically is is based on the order flow that's coming into the market and it's definitely a different perspective that we hold on what drives price but our edge is based ultimately in understanding that order flow is what drives price you know most traders are looking at price as the cause of price and I think that's where they find difficulty in identifying and building any sort of real edge in the market where I look at price as the result the after effect if you will of the order flow and when we're talking about order flow, simply put, what are we talking about? The supply and demand caused by all the buyers and sellers coming into the market, right? The buy orders and the sell orders that turn into trades is what we're tracking. And it's this flow of orders that drives the market. It's what actually causes price to move. What's your uh, average holding time, Thomas? Uh, you know, it's a great question. It really depends on the context. You know, if we're in a range-bound market, I'm going to be purely scalping. I'm not going to be holding on that long. Whereas, you know, last week, week before, we were trending hard, hitting those stops on higher time frames. You want to try and catch the move. You know, definitely not look to fade that type of activity and go with it. And when you when you catch a nice wave in the direction of almost buy the sell stops in that case, you know, you want to try and hold on for you know a little bit gotcha. deeper profit targets. You know, gotcha. but at the end of the day, it comes down to understanding and trading the markets in a way that gives you back your decision making process because you understand logically what's driving price, right? And, and that enables you to compete in the markets alongside the smart money at their own game because it's, you know, it comes down to the smart money. And if you think about why price moves, and guys, you have to be asking yourself these types of questions. It moves due to the intent and motivations of the smart money because the smart money are the ones that are running the stops. They're the traders that are responsible for getting price from point A to point B. And it's always been about the stops getting on. And we've, we've talked about that before here. That's what drives the market, stop runs. It's always been like that. A hundred years ago with Livermore and Wyckoff, same thing today with the HFTs and, and the computer algorithms. It's, it's just about those smart money traders taking advantage of the retail traders, hitting the stops, and then running it right back the other way. Kind of reminds so, me of the, uh, the old poker adage, if you don't know who the patsy is, it's you. <laughs> exactly, yeah. Yeah, you hit the nail on the head, you know, and you can't win going against the smart money, plain and simple. You know, can you get lucky once in a while? Yeah, everybody's going to get lucky. The slot machine has to pay off once in a while. But the bottom line is it's coming down to understanding how the smart money operates, you know, about where they want to do business in the market and, and how they get priced into those areas. So that's what we get. Gotcha. Next up we have Rob Hanna. Rob's a good friend of mine. We go way back to the when the earth was cooling uh, as far as uh, industry is concerned at least. I, uh, to show you what a great guy he is, I, I jokingly called him a scumbag in one of my newsletters. And then I had to spend the next three days apologizing <laughs> to all of his clients and uh, I had to read a lot of nasty emails and explain to them that's just a joke. Rob and I are kind of a 
like to take the piss out of each other. It's it. He's a good guy. Blah blah blah. But anyway, I, I kind of dig what Rob does because uh, he does a little bit of the mechanical stuff, but he mixes in a little discretion with it, or a lot of mechanical with a little discretion. Depends on how you want to look at it. And I guess I'll let Rob tell it tell you. But uh, Rob Hanna of QuantifiableEdges.com. Take it away, Rob. Tell us a little bit about yourself. A little bit about QuantifiableEdges.com. Hey, Dave. Yeah. Uh, thanks for your intro. Uh, <laughs> I've forgotten about it. He's called me a scumbag. So. <laughs> Well, payback is hell. I'm sure you. I'm sure something will happen. Interesting in Vegas. <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm running quantifiable edges since about 2008, and uh, it focuses on taking historical snapshots of of the market um, that are similar to current market action. I'll compare it in a number of different ways, be it price action, or or I'll look at things like seasonality. I'll look at volume. I'll look at uh, uh, you know, Fed flows, anything I can that appears to be giving a, 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 any kind of an edge, I will examine and, and see if uh, uh, perhaps there is an edge there. Uh, in addition to quantifiable edges, I also uh, am a co-founder at investaquant.com where we uh, do more intraday trading uh, as well as overnight. And we'll have a swing product there in the near future as well. Cool. Yeah, I'll have to... Um I know you've probably got enough work, but every now and then I come up with some ideas, and, and uh, from an empirical basis, it looks like they work pretty good. I'll have to throw some stuff at you sometimes, um, see what you think. <laughs> All right. Let put. Uh, yeah, I'm not joking. I'm <laughs> serious on that. Rob and I are going to be at uh, Traders Expo. That's what I, we were talking about before the show, uh, which is in Vegas uh, this year. I think it's in Vegas every year, isn't it, in the fall? Yeah, they got one. Yeah, they, they moved it from November to October, but it's always there, I think. All right. Um, I'm Dave Landry. For those of you who don't know me, I'm DaveLandry.com. Uh, I believe you can only predict the short term when it comes to markets. Uh, if somebody says they know they think the market will be higher a year from now, then they should sell everything and put all their money in the market. Uh, as I say in my disclaimers, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. But uh, even though you can only predict the short term, I think you could be a trend follower, and you could follow that trend as long as it moves in your favor, and that involves taking partial profits at trailing stops. Um, I have a 21-page report. If you go to my website under store right now, I'll put a banner ad up uh, over the next few days. But if you go into store, the uh, first thing you'll see is the free reports, and uh, check those out. Also, now would be a good time, uh, FYI, to check out the, the bow tie moving average report. It's, on, it's on, also on that page, and, and uh, when we get to the markets in a minute, I'll talk a little bit about more about that. Okay, uh, let's hop right into it. Let's go back to you, Jason. Uh, based on any technical fundamental indicators you want to use, would you predict that the S&P 500 index will move higher or lower uh, this week? And there's not much week left, I guess. And uh, once you predict that, and it's the close on Friday, September 11th, um, rate your confidence to that answer by estimating the probability you have correctly predicted this week's market move. Okay, uh, you're right. Holiday shortened week. Uh, I think the market is catching up with the fact that they were around on. Sunday night, Monday. Uh, the fact that we're what 300 higher in the Dow already after the big sell-off over the last couple of weeks. You know, I think what the market is basically saying is what we talked about. I think three, four weeks ago, last time I was on, is that smart money is waiting to buy the correction, and that correction was a little more than 10 percent, I think, from the traded high to the most recent low print. Would that be right? Not 12 percent change. Yeah. Yeah, 12 percent. Yeah. Right. Okay. That that is about where professional money starts to get interested because. What they're looking at is a correction. What constitutes bear market territory are the fundamental supporting bear market. It's not right now. So 10 or 12 percent, that's a reasonably good correction uh, for the most recent run-up. And then you look at the time relationship, how much time it took to reach those highs, how much time it took to sell off. I mean, it's a, it's, it's, it seems to me to be a very deep, uh, uh, thick kind of move. Um, a lot of good days in there where the market was down heavy on heavy volume and then bounce back nicely, but kind of lighter volume. And then we get that big move last week, and it was on good volume, but the next move higher, this one today, I, we, know we don't have the full volume numbers yet, but if this is the one that uh, is good quality higher volume now coming in after that sell-off, I would say this is the market buying the dip. So if that's, if that's the case, if that's the case, which I believe it is, I think we're going to be higher Friday on the 11th than we were on Friday last week. I think it will be a nice net up week. Uh, well, uh, okay, and confidence? I would say about 85 
right. I really, I really believe that was the dip. I really think that smart money was waiting for that pullback. There wasn't a lot of volume up into those high prints. You had pullbacks all the time that were, you know, 150, 200 points, maybe 300. Then it would come right back, and then, and now we had a big move, good volume, and it stopped right at a technical number that a lot of the uh, big money guys were watching anyway. So I okay. think. I think that was it. I think that was the pullback. Will be higher through the end of this week. I would say there's pretty good confidence. About 60% confidence will keep these gains uh, heading back towards uh, the highs uh, later in the year. I don't think we'll make fresh highs on the year, but I think we'll be closer to the highs of the year by the end of the year. So if this is the big dip, the next one or two weeks will really that that'll really start to play out. I think you'll see that. Okay. I hope you're right, uh, Thomas. Let's go to you. Same question. Uh, you mean me? Yeah. Do you need me to read that to you? Uh, no, no. Uh, this, I remember this part of the show. It's my least favorite part. Of the show. <laughs> the prediction part. Wait, let me get out my crystal ball and dust it off a little bit over here. Yeah. Um. You know, listen. It, it's all going to be about the Fed. I don't know. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. But the Fed. What happens with the Fed next week? We got China affecting the market. I think could could the market have made a good low and that's it and, and we go on to make new highs? Absolutely, it's it's definitely possible. I'm, I'm not a, a perma bear by any means, but I do think that low needs to be tested. And then now you get back into the time. It's like a binary option. Like you know, you think the market's going to get to a certain point, but is it going to do it by that time? I, I if I if if you're going to hold the proverbial gun to my head, I'm going to say we're going to be lower on Friday. Okay. Um, I think we go down low and retrace some of this weakness that came in. I think we still have a very unstable environment, a range below where we're at right now that needs to we need some back and fill down there. And it could very well be the bottom, but I think it needs to be tested and filled out a little bit, maybe into the Fed, and then we see what the Fed comes out with, and that's gonna determine the next big move from there, whether it's back up to new highs or, or back down and take out the low and make new lows. All right, what kind of confidence are you gonna give that? Uh a, a seven. Seven and a half. Seven and a half. There we go. All right, Rob, same question. And uh, by the way, it says it's from Tuesday's open, so if you guys want to change your exit. All right, uh, David has Monday's open, but I'm just assuming you mean um, today's open, right, David? Yeah, that was a typo. The, uh, the okay. dates are different, but yeah, no. Oh, the dates are Okay, so it's, it's in case you guys want to change your mind, it's from today's open to Friday the 11th's close. And uh, Rob, go ahead to you. Okay, well, I'm... Uh, I'm kind of with Thomas in that I'm not feeling real strong in either direction right now. I am pretty squarely neutral for the short term. Uh, and the reason for that is I've got a fair amount of conflicting evidence that I'm seeing. So uh, on the bearish side, uh, I posted a study uh, over the weekend that looked at, you know, uh, of the, um, uh, since 2000, there have been 12 times where we've seen a 1% drop going into a, a three-day weekend. And uh, 11 of those 12 times, um, at the end of the next week, we were lower. Um, we've all, I've also got some studies that looked at uh, volume. For instance, Thursday's rally happened on very light volume, uh, lowest in 10 days. Now, some of that can be excused by the fact that you're moving on, you know, towards the end of the summer there. Um, but typically, when it happens um, above the 10-day moving average and below the 200-day moving average like that, you get a you get a pullback in the next few days. Um, so we may still see some more of a, of a pullback. On the other hand, um, as Jason pointed out, we had a real strong, uh, what seemed to be almost a capitulative bottom uh, a few weeks ago. I have one indicator that I use. I call it my capitulative breadth index, and it signals normally two, three times a year. Um, and what it does, it, it measures the number of individual stocks that are undergoing extreme selling for lack of a better um, definition, and uh, so extreme that they're likely to, to bounce over the short term. And that actually hit um, its highest reading ever uh, in August. It, higher than uh, 2001, higher than 2008, higher than you know the, uh, all of the other, the 2000 fell off, uh, because it was so sharp um, and it was so broad, the selling. Um, so that was uh, pretty remarkable, and I expected a bounce out of that. That has not quite recovered to neutral territory yet, so it's still suggesting we should see more of these stocks continue to, to bounce uh, in the coming days and, and, and perhaps week or so. Um, now that can get reduced uh, quite strongly, but I would be um, 
no matter how much other short evidence I see, I don't ever see myself shorting until that gets back to neutral. Gotcha. So up or down and percentage. Yeah. Oh, uh, so if I had to guess a direction, I would say lower, and uh, my confidence would be, you know, 50%. All right. Well, uh, I'll flesh things out in, in, in the next uh, question, but I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with lower. Um, I try to keep things simple. I, I, I think it's a. I often say you can only predict the short term, as I just said a few minutes ago. Some of my clients have misconstrued that into that you could always predict the short term, and and trust me, if you could always predict the short term, you probably wouldn't see my fat ass again. But uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be here grinding it out every day. Um, but uh, when you have a certain setup, then you can pre predict the short term. But what I've been doing with these shows, because I, I kind of hate having to predict the market out like this, because it's not exactly uh, what I do, although I do kind of keep an eye on things, obviously. But uh, what I started doing, instead of trying to outsmart the market, and my nickname in industry is the trend following moron. So I, but uh, with the, um, for these shows, for purposes of the shows, I just say, okay, if the market – is above certain moving averages, or if the moving averages have crossed over, just simple metrics like that, I decide whether or not I think the market is higher or lower. So I, I stayed bullish for a long, long, long time, and now we've breached some of these things, and I'm seeing some sell signals, which I'll flesh out in the next uh, segment. So until proven otherwise, until the market gets back maybe into this overhead uh, supply that we have a ton of, which I'll show you in one second, I'm going to go ahead and stay with lower, and I'm going to stay that way for a long time, and I'm going to give it a confidence of, uh, of 75%, which is kind of high for me, but uh, I'm just kind of, I think the market's still in trouble, and I'll, again, I'll flesh that out in just one second. Uh, Jason, let's go back to you. Uh, what developing events that can be technical or fundamental will you be watching out for trading this week that might have a positive or negative impact on the S&P 500 and other U.S. markets between now and Friday's close is uh, what we're looking for. Okay, I would uh, I would tell you that I think it's going to be really hard uh, for the market to ignore what's happening in China. I think that's been on everybody's minds, and now we're starting to see it really start remain in the headlines now, day after day, a couple of times a day. It's, I think the market's going to have a hard time ignoring that, and the reason I say that is because the, uh, the smart money is trying to take advantage of buying the dips because I think they believe that there's still more to go. I, I think that's the, the setup, the the uh, the, the the basic background there. Um, the Fed's coming up with a, a possible, the market is really expecting a rate hike. But the big question is, is it going to be one and done, or is this the beginning of a normalization policy? And I think the data is there that says no chance for normalizing policy. It's just not there yet. I think it, it might be a token one quarter point move, and that's still historically low. It's gone from roughly zero to a quarter point. I mean, I, I think the psychology behind that is way overblown, yeah, way overblown yeah. the significance of that. So I think the market is going to be watching this this fundamental from overseas. What is that? You know, is the, I think the market's going to have a hard time ignoring that, and that would be a negative influence. What's happening with the Fed, once it's done and out of the way, there's going to be a knee jerk on that, but I think it's going to be seen as a buying opportunity because historically nothing has really changed. They're basically keeping the punch bowl there because it's a, a quarter point hike is not going to materially make anybody. You go back and look at everything you've ever paid money for in your life and, and put another one quarter of a point cost of business on that somewhere and tell me you can't figure out a way over that to keep things yeah. Growing. I mean, it's silly to even think that it's going to be important. Well, you know, it's it's not the absolute rates; it's it's the uh, fear or the delta in rates that's got everybody right. a little spooked. Yeah, it seems like see. people forgot about that already. You know, now it's China; it's always something. But uh, I hear you. Well, um, I just I just got to mention this real quick because you know, if you look at the dollar yen as a proxy for what's happening in China, and look back on the last, you know, you asked for just a little bit. What could be an indicator there? China, Japan is China's biggest market, maybe other than the U.S., depending on, you know, it's their biggest Asian market anyway, right? You look at the high prints last month, dollar yen, it was a test of the high for the year. And in a three-day period of time, we gave back all the money made in one, in one week. Yeah. And the market hit the low prints right around the lows for the year. The same low print seen in January, same low print area in December, 
and freaking exploded in four more days, right back to uh, uh, where it was uh, back in May, June, and July. So, I mean, what happened in August? That was the fear factor. Professionals bought that. And, I mean, here we are now at the beginning of September. There's no follow-through. There's, I think there's a real lack of conviction that um, uh, there's going to be a big major headache that's going to cause a rise in uh, the value of the yen. I think that it's still business as usual. I mean, true, dollar yen hasn't had a huge range for the past year, but it's hard to ignore that uptrend. And I think that all things considered, the market is still looking, the S&Ps, the stock market, I think is still looking for more upside over the next some period of time. And I, I don't think what happens in uh, the Fed is really going to materially affect it. It's going to cause that whipsaw that we got to learn to figure out a way to take advantage of that if you're, uh, going to go with the broader base fundamentals, but I think what's happening in China, it, it's all over. It's hard to ignore, but the fact is, yeah. it seems that those dips, they're, they're buying opportunities. I mean, I've seen moves in currencies that would curl your hair. That yeah. move from 124 to 118, that, that was a, a hiccup. That was a little, you know, push me, pull you type move. I think it was used as an opportunity by uh, smart traders to get positioned for longer term. I don't think there's that liquidation move, it followed the Dow right along down and then boom, right on technical support and was right back in the game again. So I think that there's a, a there's a relationship there that China is the excuse for lower prices. You want to buy those prices. And I think that... Yeah, that, that dollar yen really kind of mirrors the market, but I, I, I'm kind of bearish. So it's kind of just the opposite of you. You see the snapback. I see it as just kind of a retrace. I think the dollar yen's really? in a lot of trouble. Isn't that amazing how people can look at the same data come with two yeah. completely different points of view? <laughs> yeah, and you know that's what that's what the novices don't real you know that's what the novices don't realize. They think that us quote unquote pros we have yeah, all the answers. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> right? yeah, that too. But uh, no, we take educated guesses. And look at Rob; he's about to fall out of his chair. Uh, we take educated guesses, and, and that's where it yeah. stops. And uh, money management and, and following your plan comes into place. But yeah, there's more than one way to skin a cat. I mean, you you know, right. you sound like you might be doing some, uh, well, I, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Are you doing any mean reversion type of trading or are you trend well, following? Well, I'd be more than happy to tell you. I, my life is an open book. That's what I tell my clients, you know, that, that there's no point in discussing it unless we're discussing it openly and honestly so we can get the Amen. Of, you know, so I mean, if you ask me what I'm looking for, I'm buying dips in the dollar. I think the dollar's got more upside and uh, that's how I'm positioning it. Now, I don't know how that's going to play out in the next couple of weeks or months, but I, you know, I'm looking at the pullbacks as an opportunity to get long dollars. I don't think that that move is really over yet. I think that there's still more to go. Now, all the pullbacks that we've seen, oh my God, pounds, 158. I mean, I was all I was moving this last week and a half. I was all over that. I can't trade when I'm moving, and I'm like, I missed that short big time, you know? Oh, man. But uh, I, I, if somebody would ask me, what would you have done with British pounds at the 157 to 58 handle, I would have said I'd sell it with both hands. Well, now that hindsight's a wonderful thing, you know, would I say the same thing with dollar yen? I would say, yeah, I w I'd be a buyer. Anything near the 119 area, I'd be all, of the, all over it. But that's me, you know? I, uh, that's my point of view. So yeah. that's how I'm playing it. That's how I'm playing it. Right now I'm flat. I'm waiting for the next opportunity, and if that shows up, you can bet. You can call my office. I'll tell you the date and time I put it right on. You know, it's that's cool. Right there on it. I really think there's more to go, but that's me. Well, cool. Well, well maybe if it works out, you'll change that uh, 20 euros you're holding to uh, to 100 euros. How's that? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right, Thomas. Let's go to you. Uh, with developing events, technical fundamental, will you be watching out for this trading week? Which uh, is obviously on uh, Friday, September 11th. Uh, that might have a positive or negative impact on the S&P 500 and other U.S. markets. Sure. And uh, Jason, since I'm follically challenged, can we leave the hair analogies out of this, please? <laughs> um, well, wait, you know, wait, I didn't hear that. The phallically challenged? Follically. <laughs> oh, I don't know. Yeah, I play nice. I don't know if I'd... I don't know if I'd want to. Uh, I didn't know if I'd want to like admit that. Jason will be here all week, folks. Try the veal. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> everyone returned this morning, you know, from the Labor Day weekend in an upbeat mood. U.S. stock futures firmly higher and fresher expectations, you know, with the Chinese central bank injecting more stimulus. So, you know, we're, we're looking at Chinese data. What's happening over there? Uh, the latest data reflecting soft domestic demand at the time when external demand is also relatively weak, which puts, which puts pressure on the government to step in and increase spending, you know, very similar to the, the scenario that we've seen over here the last couple of years and, and on the People's Bank of China to potentially inject another dose of monetary policy stimulus. You know, 
China easing expectations definitely helped to prop up the markets in Asia on Tuesday, which carried into to our markets over here. We'll see what follow through we have into the overnight session into tomorrow. But besides what's happening in China, which every night you see the, the markets are pretty volatile on Globex, you know, 8, 9 o'clock when they open up in the Far East, you see that volatility coming in. But besides that, it's, it's just a countdown in the FOMC next week, right, with, with uh, a week left to go. Everyone's trying to zero in on any clues they can pick up on whether the central bank is ready to raise interest rates. And it, it's, it, in my opinion, it's a crapshoot, you know. Um, I don't know. On one hand, you have economics, economists and, and TV talking heads that are certain that uh, a rate hike is going to be inevitable. On the other hand, the bank that you could say runs the New York Fed, Goldman Sachs, is doubling down on its call that the Fed will not hike in September, putting out a list on zero hedge of seven reasons why, why the Fed won't hike. So, uh, you know, who knows? It's, it's a crapshoot with news. It always is. And, and it's not only the news itself. It's, it's what's priced in and what isn't priced in yet. We have no way of knowing that, you know? So all we can do is, is try and pick up on clues once the news comes out, what inflection points are holding, where the major levels in the market are holding or not holding, and, and, and try and go along for the ride. You know, pick up on clues what the smart money is doing. And, 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 you know, if the volatility is too high, in most cases, we're better off just not doing anything. Let it calm down a little bit. Look for the clues. They'll show up. Just need a little patience, and then, and then we'll look for our spots. But that's it. You know, it's, it's China, and it's the Fed right now, basically. Yeah. Rob, Rob has done some interesting research where uh, the speech where you gave about it was taking um, more and more money to get the market going. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Like it was just like a drug. And, and the Fed at some point switched from, uh, I guess, fiscal responsibility, for lack of a better phrase, to uh, let's do whatever we can do to shore up the markets, whereas it, it used to be years ago, and all of us here have been around the block from what I can tell uh, quite a bit, but I remember we used to be like, come on, give us something, give us something, and it just it was so hard for the Fed to give you anything, and then now it's like I think they kind of painted themselves into a corner. Yeah, they're just kicking the can down the road. You know, kicking the can down the road. I love that yeah. analogy. You know, I always forget yeah. to use that. They're bringing more liquidity in. You know, and that's what's, what's been propping up the markets. Let's see what happens when they stop doing that, you know. So we'll see. Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to go ahead and uh, see if I get a chart shared here. Um, there's a couple things I'm looking at. There, it's pretty simple. Um, I don't know if you guys have seen that or not. But, yeah, it looks like it's come up. One thing I'm paying attention to, first of all, is that we have a lot of overhead supply here. And it, nothing magical about my form of technical analysis. But anyone who bought during this range might be looking to get out at break even. And the longer we stay below it, and the further we stay below it, the more important it becomes. If we have a bit of a blip down, blip up, like I think uh, Jason's kind of alluding to, possibly, then it becomes a big old do-over, and nobody gets too excited. People are just coming back from vacation, like, oh, we have the market, oh, it dropped, it came back. Looks like my portfolio looks okay. But if, if they start getting losses in here, then it becomes a concern. And if you back the chart out, obviously we've been in a pretty serious uptrend for a long, long time, going back a few little blips here and there. But you can go all the way back to 2009, and obviously we had a good uptrend. And it's like a new round of investors comes in every few years, and all these people that came in in 2009 are now thinking that, oh, well, we can have a bull market forever, nice uh, six-year run in here. The other thing that's concerning is that if you look at these bow tie moving averages, a 10-day simple, a 20-day exponential, a 30-day exponential, when they come together and they get to spread out again, it forms a pattern I call a bow tie. It looks like that pattern will complete this week on a weekly chart. It's completed on a daily and a two-day and a three-day and a four-day recently. What's concerned about what's concerning about the weekly is, as I preach quite often, is if you have a sell-off of all-time highs or at least major highs, then it could be fairly significant. You can see the last two sell-offs from all-time highs were 2000 and late 2007, early 2008. We had a pretty serious slide in the market. And then obviously we had the bottom in 2003, and the same thing happened in 2009. 2009 was a little late to the party uh, because all indicators had lag, uh, but the market still doubled from there, so it was a decent signal nonetheless. So I'm hoping this is wrong. I'm hoping this is the first time in 20, 30 years that it's not going to work. I prefer if the market just went straight back up. I'm not a big fan of the short side, but as I wrote in today's column, you have to love the trend you're in. I've done, uh, I did a short video, maybe like two minutes on this on YouTube if you want some more information. And I also 
If you go to my YouTube YouTube channel, youtube.com slash C is in custom slash Dave Landry, uh, you can see I do a weekly webinar called The Week in Charts, and you can look at the uh, those. And in those, I talked about a lot of things such as the Death Cross, and I went back and looked at the last uh, 115 years or so with that on the Dow, and then the last, uh, I guess, 40 or 50 years in the S&P 500. So it's kind of interesting. Uh, sometimes the market goes down 80, 81% afterwards, but uh, obviously as a mechanical system, uh, before I get myself too much trouble, I'm sure Rob said, you can't necessarily trade something like that mechanical, but when you do get a sell signal, I think you have to pay attention to it. As uh, I quoted Greg Morris this morning, uh, back when he was uh, running billions and billions of dollars, uh, he wrote in investing with the trend, you have to take signal seriously as if each one will be the big one and as I also wrote it's like um, you know it's kind of like a, this could be a Fred Sanford signal I'm, I'm coming Elizabeth so uh, <laughs> that's um, it's got me a little concerned so anyway uh, so that's that's my two cents and, and why I'm concerned about the market and I try to keep it simple as far as overall market analysis if we get back into this range and start probing new highs then I'm turning bullish again, but as long as we stay under these moving averages and the moving averages have crossed over and we're under all this overhead supply, I'm a little worried about uh, about this market. Uh, the only thing is uh, you don't have to rush out and sell everything. Uh, protective stops will do that. We got stopped out of everything over the last few months, and we had no new longs to put on because it was nothing worthwhile. So being selective helps out a lot, and um, we, just, uh, we just triggered into oil. So every now and then, You'll get a commodity-related area that can uh, trade contra to the overall market. And, and so I think that if you're not shorting, you might want to see something that's uh, – take a look at commodities, see if they're bottoming out. And, and if not, uh, maybe something very inefficient like the occasional IPO that can trade contra to the overall market. Okay, uh, let's go to – let's go back to you, Jason. Hey, uh, Dave, uh, Dave? Go ahead. Hey, do I get to answer that question, you scumbag? <laughs> wait, 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 I didn't catch that. <laughs> you skipped over me. Oh, again? <laughs> that was good. <laughs> oh, no one knows what it was. Like, Rob didn't have much to say. All right. All right, I called that. We were talking about I started talking. You didn't give him a chance to say anything. <laughs> yeah. I got all excited. I started looking at charts and get excited. I'm such a nerd. <laughs> all right, bro. I got a little tick mark. I got a tick mark next to your name, too. Um, all right, Rob. <laughs> and last, and uh, uh, I don't know, know, certainly right. not least, uh, we have Rob Hanna. All right, Rob. Uh, and, and, uh, famous, you were you were a magician for many years, weren't you? No, you were a Rod Stewart impersonator. <laughs> I remember that. Lounge singer, yeah. You were a lounge singer, yeah. I'm also an MMA fighter right now. Oh, yeah. oh cool. I'm a fighter right now, if you look me yeah. And a moto, you were a motocross, uh, virtual <laughs> motocross um, champion at one point. Yep. Yep. That was in the seventies. I don't look at done it all. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Rob. What developing events, technical fundamental, would you be watching out for this week that might have a positive or negative impact on the markets? Uh, well, you guys were talking about the Fed, and uh, that's that's one thing I'm going to be very interested in. Um, as you know, David, I, I've talked about it a bit that. Basically, since 2003, is which is as far back as the uh, the Fed SOMA data goes. SOMA being the, their system open market account, uh, they publish on their website what uh, the the total holdings in that account. And whenever it's been rising, the market's been doing well. And whenever it's been pulling back or even going sideways, the market has struggled. Now it's gone sideways since October, and we saw a big dip right before QE ended in October, and part of that could be blamed on Ebola, and I think a good portion of that could have been blamed on fear of the end of QE. Um, and now we got a big dip where um, we're looking at a possible Fed tightening next week, and so maybe that's the same thing we saw in October where it's a uh, uh, just a kind of a fear dip and it turns out that we're going to chop sideways for a while longer. I think we're going to struggle to be in a big bull market without the Fed uh, supporting us at this point. But uh, if it does turn out to be something more than, you know, uh, a one tick up, uh, I think the market's probably going to be due for some, some much deeper pullback than we've seen so far. 
Uh, now, in the short term, um, I'm primarily a short-term trader, and if the market's in a pullback for a, for a long-term trend, that does, that's not necessarily a terrible thing. Uh, there's still a lot of opportunities to play uh, in a bear market. Uh, for the most part, you need to just be more nimble. So, yeah. uh, bear markets are more emotional, and moves happen quicker. And so, if you're going to get long, you got to get long quick and take your profits quick. And if you're going to get short, you got to get short and take your profits quick. And it's not the kind of thing where you can just kind of like a bull. So, uh, you got to profit off everybody else's overreactions during an emotional bear. Yeah, well said. I, you know, my problem is I, I my methodology is to take the short term gain, which works out really nice on the short side, but then hang on for a longer term gain. And that holding on on the short side is a real pain. Um, all right. Uh, sorry about uh, that. Uh, skipping you. I wasn't. Uh, that was not intentional. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jason. Let's go to you. Any uh, any closing thoughts or anything else you want to tell us about uh, the lineonline.com? Hey. Uh, did you, did you uh, do question four? Oh, I'm all messed up this week. <laughs> all right. All right, let's start over. <laughs> all, right. all right, Jason, sorry about Tom, that. You, Jason, can you take <laughs> over hosting duties now? I guess I just got fired as host. <laughs> I guess I better, sit, I better sit back all those checks. Uh, anyway. You still doing those shots of Uzo over there, uh, Dave? Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, you were here on that show. That's what it is. I got uh, I got hooked on the Uzo after the, uh, the Grease debacle. All right. <laughs> And I've got it all outlined here, too. I don't know why. I, and, uh, for some reason, I ticked off Rob. Well, yeah, I ticked off Rob. I, how's that? <laughs> and uh, Anyway, all right. We, we've, we've reached the point of silliness. Uh, Jason, question number four. Uh, we'll, we'll edit all this out. Um, <laughs> have, you, uh, have you had the most success with fully automated trading systems or... or wait... Or trading systems that are at least partially discretionary. Yeah. Okay. That's uh, I, when I saw that question, I thought that was very timely. That uh, David had put that in for this week's timing research. So I think that's very, very apropos because right now there's a huge amount of focus that um, you know traders, at least I've seen anyway, from maybe more on the public side, that um, they can find an automated process and in addition to an automated process I mean what they hear in uh, general market communication and just general what's on the news and all the rest is, is fully automated guys you know making consistent money and high frequency traders and that are fully automated they run way in the, I mean a human being can't even keep up with them so I think that there's a general uh, big push in people's thinking to try to automate and I've going around the block on this issue and I can tell you with absolute certainty that a guy that knows what he's doing and understands market psychology will outperform an automated system hands down and I don't care what it is I agree now, right now the problem with that <laughs> is that we are now evolved into a marketplace that is for the most part I mean currencies for certain but uh, almost every other market is evolved into a 24 hour seven day market currencies are 24 five and three quarters depending on who you talk to I mean we're almost six days a week sooner or later I think every other market's going to be six to seven days a week I think currencies at some point will be seven days a week and we're 24 hours a day I mean a human being simply cannot keep up with that you can't you just when are you going to sleep you know so I think the marketplace is heading towards some degree of automation but I think that that automation really needs to be taken with a huge multi a 500 pound grain of salt because I think people don't understand that automation when you automate something that's just somebody's it's just someone's opinion it's just somebody's point of view that they say well but here's what I do I take this indicator and that indicator and this piece of information I combine it all together and if it meets my criteria with this smoothing average or overload envelope or algorithm that's a buy signal or that's a sell signal and it's all based on the same issue that Thomas talked about which I think is huge overlooked is that people think price is something that matters price doesn't matter price is what we exploit what matters is what goes on behind the price and so if you try to automate something a computer cannot take into account the relationship between how people are thinking acting and behaving who has to liquidate who's holding a loss 
who doesn't have to do anything because he's properly positioned, who's adding, who's subtracting. All that data has to be compiled after the fact, and a computer can't anticipate that in real time. I actually wrote about this in uh, my book, um, The Art of the Trade, where I talk about the relationship to automated uh, process and how uh, a thinking individual can outperform that. And I believe that we have to, as traders, we have to find a happy medium. And to make a long story even longer, what, what I'm really saying is, is that my best success has been with a systemized approach that takes into account the things that I value and I'm willing to enforce it, which is a psychological edge. I have to say, when the signal goes ding and it's time to buy, I don't care what the news is. I don't care what's happening out there. I don't care what my my tarot cards say. You know, it's it's over. It's a buy signal. Enter the order. Well, the automation helps with that process of rethinking or second guessing a signal, and the signal itself has to have an edge to it. So I, I would say that to answer the question, the best success I've had is twofold. It's number one, knowing the signals that have the high probability for me. I've got lots of prob lots of signals that just don't matter in certain markets, and I ignore them. A signal, a systemized approach can't ignore it. It's got to take it into account. Uh, so a, a, high, a degree that's somewhat discretionary along with signals that you know work in certain markets. Certain signals work really well under certain conditions. If those conditions exist, if you can automate that entry, like I'm in the process of doing that right now, a lot of times I'll get a tremendously good quality short-term buy or sell signal happens in, in London at 2 o'clock in the morning here Eastern. I can't be up for that seven days a week, you know, for the whole month. So I found that my success has been a little bit has been has been helped by automating, but the automation has to be really well understood why you're doing it. So I think it's a for me what's made the difference is getting a good quality approach that I know has got an edge, being able to enforce those edges, knowing which ones are better, which ones should not be taken under certain conditions, and then automating as much of that as you can to help alleviate the stress of being seven days a week, seven. 24 hours, seven days a week trader. You can't do that. So I think automating it has got to be taken into consideration with what the, the type and nature of the trader, how good his signals really are. If he's using an automated system he bought off the shelf, don't expect more than about 15 to 18% a year and you know, just period because they just don't perform like you think they do. You know, I mean, there's, there's a lot of things that you have to take into account in my opinion, but I think the best approach is to figure out your own edge Know what your own edge is and find a guy who can program that edge to auto-execute the entry and then manage it from there. Run your stops uh, <laughs> manually. You know, uh, be a, be, know which conditions to turn the system off. You know, I mean, here's the problem. Can, can I take one more second? Or, sure. or is it Okay. Here's, here's the problem. The problem is, is that the markets can only do three things, and they're still based on underlying structure. They can either trend higher or trend lower which the market condition there is order flow imbalance, which Thomas uh, would understand that concept, order flow imbalance. And then it can range trade, which is order flow balance. And order flow balance mm -hmm. will always give way to imbalance. So if you have developed an approach, an edge that is trend following, you're going to get two opportunities out of three when the market's doing something. It's either going to be trending higher or trending lower. So if it's range trading, you want to turn your system off because your, your trend signals are not going to work. So why well, the sun, you, you know, know, my point is, as we say in the South, the sun doesn't shine the same dog's ass every day. I've been getting emails after emails from all these people. Well, I just trade spreads now, and I'm making all this money. Well, guess what? After this little crash, I'm not hearing from them anymore. I mean, I'm not laughing at them. It's not shutting Friday. It's just kind of like, I, you know, I, 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 I told you. <laughs> right, is that, and that's so. the same, that, exactly the problem, is that, if you're gonna like, I've got uh, a set of signals that works great for like bottoming or topping or reversals or edge of range, and that's wonderful. I don't have yeah. any idea if you know how far that's going to go. So I got a rule management approach to that. I could automate part of that rule management, but you know if the rule says roll a break even stop because certain price action has happened and that's 20 minutes before a Fed announcement, no, I'm gonna I'm gonna sit through that volatility because. That volatility is usually going to work for that signal. So I don't want to get stopped out at break even. I'll let it work a little bit. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. But a, com but a computer can't do that. A computer is either yes or no. You know, either yes, I'm going to run this rule, or no, I'm not. So I think the relationship between having something of what you do automated to take advantage or exploit 
the 24-hour developing nature of the market and the fact that you need some help anyway so you don't second-guess yourself, I think that's a great idea. But just turning it on and checking it once a day to see how rich you're getting is just ridiculous. That's never going to happen. Yeah, we'd, I'd love that push a button, get a peanut uh, type of system. Oh, you know I that, would, that, yeah, I would love it too, but it's just not reality. And, I, you know, there's more money to be made by being smart and paying attention. So Yeah, the uh, the, uh, the when the market broke down out of the rage, it kind of reminded me of uh, the Holy Grail Monty Python where – you know, the guy's like, oh, it's just a little rabbit. You know, he's talking about how vicious this rabbit was, you know. And then the rabbit flies up and, like, eats the guy's head off. And the guy's like, I told you. I told you right, yeah. <laughs> All right, Rob, so we don't forget about you. Let's just go to you next and get it. Just get it over with. Uh, I forgot what the question was. <laughs> oh, um, I think it's a good question for you since you're sitting over there playing with your computer all day. Um, <laughs> have you had the most success with fully automated trading systems or trading systems that are at least partially discretionary? To you, Rob. Um, it is an interesting question to me. It, um, I do both. So um, most of my trading is partially discretionary, and I would say if I had to choose between the two, I've had more success with that. Um, but I don't see anything wrong with automating your strongest edges. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that's a good way to go. As uh, Jason was saying, it's tough being there around the clock. Um, and, you know, I think experienced traders uh, who have been through bull markets and bear markets and have a real strong understanding of their system and... Um, uh, what's behind it and the edges it plays off of, um, they can outperform a system. But I think most people that take a system that is, assuming it's a good system, um, uh, take an automated system and try and change it on the fly and make decisions on the fly, um, end up underperforming the system. Yeah, uh, and I think that's because uh, uh, they get caught up in the emotions. Um, you know, the, the second guessing doesn't work. Everything was all those emotions that were built into the market when testing these systems back and back. Um, uh, you know, the, the same kinds of things played out. So uh, it's just like how they say, you know. 70, 80 percent of people underperform the market. Well, everyone's got a plan, right? Right. And everyone's got a system that's either until they get punched in the face. And, hold. and the people that say, right. And so, even if your system is buy and hold, you get a, you, you hit a big bear market, and most people say, ah, oh, forget it, I'm out. And that's how they underperform during their lifetime, right? Yeah. So um, I think it, that you. People are capable of outperforming systems, but you know, if I was to say, "Hey, uh, you mentioned the death cross. You know, the golden cross is the opposite of that. Only be long when you're above the 200-day moving average. When the 50 is above the 200-day moving average, if someone was to just do that, I think that's a fine system to, uh, for a lay person who isn't a, you know, consider themselves a trader to to be in the market, and they may they'd probably equal the market returns over time with a lot less stress." And by doing that, they beat 80% of the people out there. Yeah, amen. Good points. Yeah, I mean, Rob, we could talk about this all day, but, I mean, that's, that's good stuff. And, and, and I like to – I, I kind of dig the way it's not uh, your way or the highway, and, and you just kind of look at the data and, and see what's there. And then, uh, like like a while back, you were telling me you were getting sales signals but the market was going straight up. So you're like, you know what, I'm full of discretion on that. I'm not going to sell this market. I'm not going to fight the tape. So I just – I kind of dig what you do. Um, anyway, I don't want to get too much of a love fest for Rob. <laughs> Trying to make up for these scumbag <laughs> remarks. And about All right, we'll be fine. Right. Why don't you do yeah. that? Yeah, I might. Uh, you, could probably, you could probably sneak in my Roman shirts, eat my bed in Vegas or something. Huh? Uh, Thomas DeLayla, let's go back over to you. Uh, same question. Have you had the most uh, success with fully automated trading systems or trading systems that are at least partially discretionary? 
Well, I think Jason hit the nail on the head. Me personally, I've been transitioning more and more to automated. You know, my tools reflect that. The way that I'm reading the order flow reflects that. I'm letting the computer read more of the order flow and alert me to specific conditions where back in the day I would I would do the work myself, the groundwork. You know, I understand what the computer is telling me because I've programmed the stuff or I had somebody program it for me, but yet I've, I've programmed it to make my decision making quicker. You know, I, I mean, how can you argue against automation in today's markets? You know, but, but you, Tom, need to Tom, I gotta, I, Tom, can I just jump in there and, and tell the sure. audience if they're not listening? You absolutely, one thousand percent nailed it when you said that my signals and my edges, I know what the computer is telling me. In other words, yes. you—that's the only benefit that any of this technology can give you—is you have to know what it's, what you got to ask it to compile something that you know, one thousand percent what it means to your edge. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Yeah, so I just I mean, wanted to say that. Thanks. I, I just thought that was so important to reiterate. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Absolutely. And it's true. I mean, you, you need to start with a viable edge. You know, automation is not a holy grail. You know, and, and like Jason said, also, you know, people people might tend to think, oh, if I automate, you know, that's going to be the answer I've been looking for. And it's not the answer you're looking for, but if you have an edge, it can definitely help you. You know, uh, someone, uh, even with the HFTs that are programmed that we're up against today in, the, in today's environment, you know, someone's automation ultimately was based originally on their discretion. You know, it had to work for them originally in some level for them in order to, to, to want to automate and turn into an HFT. You know, so what are the advantages of automation? Well, you take the emotion out of the process, which is very, very important. It allows you to make quick decisions, which is, in fact, it's taking the decision-making process out of it, right? It's making the decision for you. And, you know, as the day goes on as a trader and, and people have this mindset, well, I, if I have an edge, it's true, you should try and, and let that edge play out as often as you can throughout the day. But as the day goes on, the problem is you get tired, you lose your energy, you lose your focus, where obviously that's, the computer isn't going to have those problems. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's definitely a benefit to lean towards automating once you have a viable edge. And, and you know, that's the key. Cool. Well, I have, a, I have a lot to say about this, so let me try to uh, wrap it up as quickly as possible. Uh, I have a degree in computer science, so I figured I might as well use it when I changed careers over 20-something uh, years ago. And I used to wake up early and just program, program, program all these mechanical systems. And usually by the end of the day, I'd, I'd, I'd come up with something that was uh, that looked pretty cool, cool or interesting or whatever. And I would go home and... Uh, my wife would sub. My wife Marcy would suffer a fool gladly as I explained to her the percent corrects and blah blah blah. It's about of all the statistics of the latest system that I found. And then one day it was a bit of an epiphany for me. She said she actually said something. She said, "How many systems do you really need?" And I'm like, kind of hit me. Well, you just need one. You need the one that you're going to follow, and the one that you're going to uh, believe in, and, and again, the one that you're going to follow. Um, I think you have a brain in your head, so I think you should use it, and that's where uh, I, I dig again, you know, not to have a love fest for Rob, but I like the fact that he does this uh, mechanical testing, and then he puts that little layer of discretion on it. I think that's pretty cool. I have a lot of uh, mechanical uh, trading, uh, friends who trade mechanically in this uh, business, and some of them think that I'm more mechanical that I am discretionary, even though I hold myself out as 100% discretionary trading trader. And a lot of times it's the flip side too. I think that a lot of these mechanical guys, or a lot, uh, use a lot more discretion than they than they think they, they they do. They claim to be automated traders, but in reality, I think they're putting a little uh, discretion on it. The the problem with with a uh, a mechanical system, as Rob said earlier, is you're looking at an aberration of the market, and markets are constantly changing. So to those people, like I said earlier, the sun doesn't shine on the same dog's ass every day. To those people that came in, and I've seen this time and time again in these choppy markets of years past. People came in and said, oh, well, look, we just we just sell the top of the range, buy the bottom of the range, and that's going to be your mechanical system. And guess what? That'll work until it don't, and, and recently it don't. So you got to be careful. And then the other thing, too, is I think if you do start – uh, developing systems, I think you should work to pick them apart versus uh, look how great they are. And I know that's uh, not to kiss Rob's butt again, but I know he's doing a lot of that type of work. But I had a guy recently kept emailing me a system and telling me how great it was and how great it was, and it was making a little bit of money, and it risked a lot. And I told him that, again, that'll work until it don't. And in one year, he had like a 40% drawdown in his, in his quote, unquote, mechanical testing. But he was arguing that well, by the end of the year, it was actually up 12%. Well, who's going to sit through 
a 40% drawdown. For all intents and purposes, that's pretty much a blow up. And even if that is part of your system, but even if you, even if you should expect that, then psychologically, uh, it's going to be pretty hard to, uh, at least for me, to, to sit through such a, a large uh, loss of money. So I, I think that's um, I think it's a very dangerous thing. Um, again, I agree with everyone here. I know we don't have uh, enough controversy in this show. I don't think uh, we should fully automate things, but I think that there are, as I think Jason said earlier, and Thomas said a few things along those lines too, it's like when you have a high uh, probability signal, I think you should almost follow it mechanically. Like right now the overall market, again, I've got that weekly bow tie. Um, I don't know if I have a representative sample of that. Maybe Rob and I can discuss this later. But, you know, you go back and look at the last 100 years or so, and it's like these are signals that you probably shouldn't ignore. Does, is there a guarantee? Obviously there's no guarantee in this business. But I think there's certain things that have happened in the past that you need to pay attention to and almost follow them uh, mechanically when they do happen in the in the markets but uh, a big fan of uh, discretion again use your brain in your head but by all means if you want to test systems go in and test them I'd also encourage you to do a lot of empirical research too and just look at a lot of charts I look at about 3,000 charts a day and I think that's made me a, a, a better chart reader in doing that you want to be a better musician play your instrument you want to get better reading charts then look at some charts anyway um, that's all I have to say about that <laughs> let's um Let's go to uh, let's go to Rob so we don't forget about him yet again. Rob, any closing thoughts or anything else you want to tell us about uh, quantifiableedges.com and those other business ventures that you're into? Uh, no, I just invite people to come by and, and check out Quantifiable Edges. I post the blog a few times a week with some interesting studies, um, and we're going to be I'm going to be overnight edges with my old site that is uh, in the process of being moved to Investaquant. So all of the um, Overnight research that I that I do is going to be over at the Invest Quant site now, so you can check that out as well. Cool. All right, Thomas, let's go over to you. Uh, Thomas Alelo, OrderflowEdge.com. Any closing thoughts or anything else you want to tell us about OrderflowEdge.com? Uh, sure. Is my mic on still? Yeah. Okay. Good stuff. Yeah. I mean, listen. It's it's. I don't want to give anybody too much information in a little bit of time, but basically. If what we talk about here today, if it if it resonated with you, and I understand we're just scraping the surface here today, but if we talked to, what we talked about here today, we're going to be holding a uh, live room Thursday morning. If you send an email to support at orderflowedge.com, or the link is at orderflowedge.com/openroom, and during the open session, that'll give us the opportunity to go into things a little bit deeper, and for us for you to see us in action and you know real time with live charts. And at the end of the day, there is no quick fix magic system. There's no one golden indicator, and I'm not here to say that trading's easy. And if you follow their methodology, you're gonna double your account every other week. You know, we all know that's a bunch of BS because it doesn't exist. But what I what I'm here to do, and, and what I'll do on a much deeper level in the room on Thursday, is share my market perspective and order flow theories. And by doing so, maybe I can help invalidate some of the common and, and inaccurate misconceptions about trading that are just so pervasive out there. And we'll go much deeper into the smart money. We'll talk about the stop runs and, and how they use that to their advantage. Cool. Good stuff. All Thank right. you. All right. Glad you, glad you were here. Jason, let's go to you. Any closing thoughts or anything else you want to tell us about the liononline.com? Uh, well, actually, uh, to close, I'd like to say thanks again for having me. I've uh, been on pretty regular now, and I appreciate the positive feedback I'm getting. I want everyone to know that uh, you know I'm a trader first. Uh, I'm not a tech guy or a marketing guy, so if you're liking what you hear, that's great. Please do me a huge favor. Go to my website, theliononline.com or .net. Either one will take you to the same homepage. Sign up for my email database. I don't send a lot of stuff out, but when I do, I think it's timely and appropriate. Uh, I'm going to be making an announcement in the next few weeks. I don't know when. Uh, I, I did ask a guy to, to work with me to update and improve uh, my use of technology. So we're going to have some new website stuff up, uh, better, faster, more easier uh, ways for you to get content or material from me as opposed to just subscribing or waiting for me to get around to it. Um, so I, I'd appreciate, you know, if you're interested and you like what you hear, open a relationship and I'll keep you posted. I promise I won't spam you. And um, uh, I'll make sure that anytime I got something I think is appropriate or uh, we'll push you in the right direction, you guys will get it. So cool. Thanks. Good stuff. Um, just real briefly, I do a weekly webinar, Dave Landers of the Week in Charts. It's every Thursday. 
at 11 Eastern. And uh, we have a lot of fun with those shows, as you probably can tell. I don't take myself too seriously, but I do uh, expound a lot upon, upon the methodology. And I cover whatever, whatever's relevant. Like last week, we talked a lot about these cell signals, such as the death cross and the bow tie. So whatever's happening, uh, I, I usually focus on that. Months prior, I talked about how important it is to be patient instead of patient and sitting your hands when the market's just chopping sideways. I have tons and tons of education on my website, so check out that tab on my website at davelander.com. I also have right about 1,400 videos up on YouTube, so check those out as you have time. And also, I do a, a newsletter, and that goes out uh, two or three times a week. And that's a, a piece called Random Thoughts and some other information and uh, latest research and free reports and things are all mentioned there, as long as, and along with um, upcoming appearances such as, uh, such as Vegas, which uh, I'll be performing with uh, Rob Hanna over there. <laughs> anyway, um, I think that's, uh, that's it. Good show, great show. Uh, all three of you guys, fantastic show. Uh, David, uh, let me turn it back over to you and uh, let you close things up. Thank you. Right. Uh, thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone. Uh, just want to remind everyone who's watching to go to timingresearch.com uh, slash reports. You can download uh, this or any past report there. Also, go to timingresearch.com slash current survey next weekend to uh, fill out the survey before the next report is published. Uh, there will be no, uh, no, no show next week. Uh, I'll be on a plane to Denver around this time. But uh, <clears throat> but the show will be back on uh, September 21st. Uh, Steve Lentz, Glenn Thompson, and A.J. Brown will be on that time. And I uh, just want to thank my guests again this week. Rob Hanna of quantifiableedges.com, Thomas DeLello of orderflowedge.com, Jason Jankowski of theliononline.com, and, of course, Dave Landry of uh, DaveLandry.com. Thanks for hosting again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thanks guys.